My name is Stella Jones, and I am the president of the Lodi Interact Club. Hello, my name is Asima Grimi, and I am the vice president of the Lodi Interact Club. My name is Rachel Zlechek, and I am the virtual vice president of the Lodi Interact Club. We would love to start off by introducing our two very special guest speakers. Today, we'll be hearing from Mr. Randy Sproul, who is our District 6250 representative of the Polio Plus Committee. Following Mr. Sproul, we will have the great honor of hearing from Mr. Mike McGovern, the chair of the Rotary International Polio Plus Committee. Before we get started, I'd like to inform you about the donation link that directly connects with Polio Plus, which is linked in the chat. Also, feel free to ask any questions through the webinar using the chat. Please stay muted as your questions will be answered by the end. With that being said, let's grant our attention to Mr. Sproul. I'd like to begin by commending you for your interest in your participation in Rotary. It's people like you who are the future of Rotary, and that's one of the reasons why I so firmly believe that Rotary's best days are yet to come. As you know, there are 35,000 <clears throat> Rotary clubs throughout the world, 1.2 million Rotarians throughout the world. Throughout the course of the year, every Rotary Club <clears throat> raises money for various local, national, and international projects. Some of those projects are funded by individual clubs. Some of those projects are funded by groups of clubs. And one of those projects is funded by every Rotarian and every Rotary Club throughout the world. That project is our effort to eradicate the polio virus uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, this is going to be kind of a timely discussion today as we discuss the polio virus and polio pandemics, given that we are in the midst of a coronavirus pandemic. Hopefully, some of the lessons that we have learned from polio, uh, we, we will be able to transfer to dealing with the coronavirus. Very briefly, the polio virus is a virus that attacks the motor neurons that control our muscles. It usually attacks the leg muscles resulting in paralysis. The paralysis is often permanent. Sometimes the polio virus attacks the lungs, and in those cases, the result is death. Uh, to give you a little bit of a better understanding of how the polio virus affects us and how the polio pandemics have affected us, I'd like to personalize the fight against polio by putting a face on the victims of polio. I'd like to do that by <clears throat> talking about a four-year-old boy, a previously healthy four-year-old boy who woke up this morning and was not able to move his legs. He cried for his parents to come and help him. They ran into his bedroom. And as soon as they took a look at their son, they knew what had happened. They knew that he had contracted polio. Over the next several days, the boy was examined by a doctor who confirmed that it was in fact polio. And the doctor told the family that there was nothing that he or any other doctor could do. And that time and time alone would determine whether or not that four-year-old boy would ever walk again. Well, days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and still that four-year-old boy was not able to move his legs. He wasn't strong enough to use crutches, and his family couldn't afford a wheelchair. So the only way that four-year-old boy was able to move around was by crawling, or by having someone carry him. Most of the time he was confined to his bed. I've often wondered what goes through the mind of a four-year-old boy lying in bed, unable to move his legs, when he hears his friends outside running and playing and laughing. Well, if there's such a thing as a lucky polio victim, it was that four-year-old boy, because after six months, he was able to regain some of the movement in his legs. During the six months that he had been bedridden, his abdominal muscles and leg muscles had atrophied. So he had to redevelop the strength in those muscles and he had to learn how to walk all over again. He did that by pulling himself up by the side of the bed, trying to take a step and falling down, pulling himself up, trying to take another step and falling down over and over and over 
until finally one day he was able to walk again. But because of the residual effects of the polio, because his right leg was rendered one inch shorter than his left leg, because his right foot was rendered two sizes smaller than his left foot, because he was never able to fully redevelop his abdominal and leg muscles, because of the residual effects of the polio, he was never able to run. He was never able to play baseball or basketball or football. He was never able to do so many of the things that most kids take for granted. Because of the residual effects of the polio, for the rest of his childhood, other kids would make fun of the way that he walked. And for the rest of his life, even the most basic of tasks often required an extraordinary and exhausting effort. Well, that four-year-old boy was my dad. And sadly, my dad's story is not unique. It's a story that has been shared by millions and millions of other children throughout the world. So let's uh, take just a couple of minutes and compare what we know about the coronavirus and what we know about the polio virus. And Tony, if you have the opportunity to put that uh, sheet up on the screen, that'd be great. Uh, we know now that the coronavirus is spread primarily by respiratory droplets. The polio virus is spread primarily through fecal contamination. We know that we can reduce the spread of the coronavirus by wearing masks, by social distancing, and by washing our hands regularly. We know that we can reduce the spread of the polio virus by developing better sanitation and hygiene. We know that the coronavirus primarily affects older people and people with pre-existing conditions. It rarely has an effect on children. The polio virus, on the other hand, affects children under the age of five almost exclusively. The coronavirus is more contagious in winter. The polio virus, on the other hand, is more contagious in summer. One in five people who contract the coronavirus will develop symptoms, and those symptoms will vary widely. But just yesterday, we, we recorded a record number of hospitalizations here in the United States, and I believe we also recorded 1,900 COVID deaths here in the United States. Only one in 200 people who contract the polio virus will develop symptoms, but those symptoms are almost always severe, usually paralysis, sometimes death. There are a number of treatments that are available uh, to treat people who have contracted the coronavirus, uh, remdesivir, steroids, blood thinners, and there are more treatments in the pipeline. There are no treatments for children who contract the polio virus. Once a child contracts the polio virus, the virus will run its course. There currently are no vaccines <clears throat> for the coronavirus, but we heard some wonderful news on Monday morning uh, that the Pfizer uh, trials are going really, really well with a 90% uh, e effective rate. Uh, we also heard some news earlier this morning from Moderna, uh, their trials are going well. So it's very likely that within the next several months, uh, vaccines will be, be available to the public. There are two vaccines for the polio virus, uh, the vaccine developed by Jonas Salk in 1955 and the oral polio vaccine uh, developed by Dr. Sabin in 1962. We don't know what the long-term effects, if any, will be of the coronavirus. It's a novel coronavirus. We think there might be lung damage down the road for people with severe cases. Uh, we do know uh, that 50% of the people who contract the polio virus will develop post-polio syndrome, which is a non-preventable degenerative condition that occurs some 30 or 40 or 50 years later. So those are a few, a few of the comparisons and differences between the two viruses. Uh, I'd like to close my comments by taking just a few more minutes uh, and summarizing what we as Rotarians have accomplished 
over the years in our fight to eradicate polio. Every day of my life, I think about what my dad and all those other polio victims went through as children. I think about what the polio survivors have gone through as adults, wondering whether they will be among the 40 to 50% of polio survivors who suffer from post-polio syndrome. I'm saddened when I think about those things, but I'm saddened even more when I think about the fact that even though an oral polio vaccine was developed in 1962, even though it costs less than 50 cents to produce and deliver the amount of vaccine required to immunize a child, and even though polio has been eradicated from the United States, throughout the rest of the world, hundreds of thousands of children continued to be paralyzed and die from the polio virus every year until 1985, when a group of people who call themselves Rotarians stood up and said, that's not right and we are going to do something about it. Those Rotarians had a grand idea. It was an idea that they called Polio Plus. They said, let's start by raising $120 million. Let's use that money to buy polio vaccine for countries that can't afford it. Let's help distribute the vaccine and let's eradicate polio from the face of the earth. So the challenge to raise that money has gone out to every Rotarian and every Rotary Club throughout the world. Rotarians have opened their wallets and checkbooks and Rotary clubs have had flour sales, candy sales, pancake breakfast, fish fries, every type of fundraiser you could imagine, knowing that with every 50 cents that we raise, one more child can be vaccinated. There were those who said that Rotarians would never be able to raise $120 million. Shame on them because since 1985, Rotarians have raised more than $1.7 billion for this noble cause. And with that money, Rotarians have been able to provide polio vaccine to more than two and a half billion children. In 1985, the year that we began our journey towards a polio free world, there were 125 countries on five continents that were polio endemic and during the year of 1985, more than 350,000 children were paralyzed by or died as a result of the polio virus. Nearly 1,000 children every single day. Think of the obstacles that stand in the way of worldwide eradication. Think of the countries that are involved in seemingly endless civil and international conflicts. Think of the countries with large numbers of nomadic or transient or homeless people. Think of some of the massive third world slums. Think of the many parts of the world where there is no developed transportation system, making distribution of the vaccine difficult. Think of the many parts of the world where there is no electricity, making it difficult to keep the vaccine refrigerated as it must be. Think of the remote villages in Afghanistan, the remote villages in the African Sahara, the remote villages in the Amazon River Basin. Think of all those things, and you'll understand why there were those who said that Rotary would never be able to eradicate polio from the rest of the world. But in spite of those obstacles, the last bastion of polio in the Western Hemisphere was eradicated in 1994, when 11,000 Rotary volunteers went door to door in the slums of Peru to make sure that every single child had been vaccinated. In spite of those obstacles, the last bastion of polio in the Western Pacific and Asia was eradicated in 1997, when Rotary volunteers went boat to boat along the Mekong River in Cambodia. And the last bastion of polio in Europe was eradicated in 1998. In parts of Africa, Rotary volunteers have walked for up to four days to vaccinate children in remote villages. Eight years ago, Rotary orchestrated the largest mass immunization campaign in world history as one million volunteers working together in India vaccinated 165 million children in just five days. Because of Rotarians, India is now polio free. And on August 25th, 2020, less than three months ago, 
the World Health Organization declared that the entire continent of Africa is now polio free. So as we sit here this afternoon, only two countries remain polio endemic, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And the World Health Organization estimates that there are now more than 19 million children who today are alive and healthy and running and playing with their friends, but who would have been paralyzed by polio, but for Rotary's polio eradication program. That's one of the many reasons why I am so proud to be a Rotarian. So uh, to keep us on schedule, I'll finish my comments there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Sproul, for donating your time today to share with us those very, very inspirational words and about your father's experience as well as your own. Thank you so much. We would now like to introduce Mr. Mike McGovern. He is the Rotary International Polio Plus Chair, and we are honored that you're here to join us. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful to be with the interactors of Lodi. I, I have to admit, when I was first invited to this, I thought I was going to Lodi, New Jersey. Uh, I, I didn't realize I was going to your state. And I went back and forth with Carol Herman as to what the time zone was, uh, just to make sure that I had the right place. And you know, I looked at Lodi, California, Lodi, New Jersey, and uh, you know, fortunately, I've, I've, I've apparently ended up in, in the right Lodi. Uh, some of you may be wondering about the background that I have uh, today. It's uh, it's actually about a mile from my home. Uh, it's a place called Portland Headlight. It's uh, this is actually a view from the lighthouse. Uh, it's a beautiful spot and all week it's been beautiful until today when uh, the weather's kind of blah. But anyway, uh, great to be with you. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful to be able to speak to an Interact club. Uh, I was, my high school never had Interact. Uh, they had a key club, which was connected with Kiwanis. Uh, but, you know, I wasn't invited to join. So uh, fortunately, all of you are having an opportunity that, uh, that, I, that I never had. So I am going to share a screen. Uh, and it's surprising that these things work so well. Uh, there we go. Yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, I know you, you've spent some time looking at the history of, of polio, but it's just amazing to me how so many things, you know, that I read about with polio, I never thought would happen again. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a book out on, you know, the history of uh, polio, particularly in the United States, and it has some of these pictures in it. But this sign, children under 16 not allowed to enter this town. This was outside New York City in 1916. And, you know, they, you know you, they say history repeats itself. It's just amazing the degree that it does. Here you see you know, another notice from a health officer in Connecticut that no one's uh, allowed in, in or out of a certain place. And, you know, a, a note on a door, keep out of this house. You know, and, and you know, sadly, we're at th this point again. Uh, you know, e even, you know, back to, with polio, schools schools had to close. Uh, and, you know, all, all of the same issues we're seeing today. Uh, they actually, I don't know if any of you ever played Candyland. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a children's game. I, I certainly played it. And this was an early version of it. But that was actually designed. Uh, by, the, by the folks in Milton Bradley Company eventually took it over uh, as, as a way of, of dealing with being inside uh, as something to do uh, when, when there was polio. And you, know, you had signs and all these other things going wrong. You know, you, most of you wouldn't remember the song, A Spoonful of Sugar Helps the Medicine Go Down. Uh, that also related to the polio vaccine. And, and that song was developed uh, for that. Uh, you know, here, uh, they actually... In, in, this was in San Angelo, Texas, I believe. Uh, yeah, Texas. Uh, that they actually sprayed DDT, uh, which is very bad. You know, it was, it was eventually banned, and uh, you know, to to try to reduce polio cases. It, had, it was you know foolish. It was a stupid thing to do. But you know, but they did it, and, and that's what happens. You know, it's, you know, you, you know about theaters and everything was closed. Public meeting spots so similar. What, what's interesting about this 
is there was an organization called the March of Dimes, and they they collected dimes. Uh, the reason they did, in part, it was dimes because Franklin Roosevelt, who had polio, uh, was was uh, you know eventually on the, the ten cent piece. But what's interesting is this is the very first example of crowdfunding. Uh, you know, back before then, there, there really weren't the charities that went out and tried to raise small sums of money from people. And it, it was the March of Dimes for Infantile Paralysis or Polio that was the very first one to do it. And you, you look at today, you know, so many charities, political campaigns, so many other things are funded by people going online and, you know, trying to collect small amounts of dollars from a lot of people. And that's really what we do in polio today. Uh, yes, we have a few people that give a lot of money, uh, Bill Gates, definitely uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. But at the same time, it was the very first crowdfunding and, you know, something that, you know, all of you do today. Uh, and, and, you know, I found this headline interesting, the sock polio vaccine proves success. This was in 1955, the year I was born. Uh, but when you look at that efficacy of 80 to 90 percent shown. And then you look at the headline in The New York Times this week. Pfizer's early data shows vaccine is more than 90% effective. So here we are, 65 years later, the same headline, the same, essentially the same percentage. So you know, it, it really shows that when something is 90% effective through uh, herd immunity uh, and you know through other measures, and, and I'm not sure about all this other vaccine if herd, herd immunity applies, but you know, it's just amazing the way it's so similar in the past. You look at the success, Dr. Sock's polio vaccine works. Uh, you know, it was, it was the top page headline in every newspaper around the world. You see Jonas Sock made the cover of Time Magazine. It was a big deal back then. Uh, but you know, the world's changed. And you know, we're still needing to immunize children. We're still out there. Uh, we had to pause vaccinations all around the world uh, because of COVID. And uh, you know, this, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly where this is, uh, but, but this is typical of the scene you see in so many countries where polio immunizations are, are ongoing. The, the uh, sanitary conditions, the trash, some of these other things, you know, aren't what we're used to in our particular neighborhoods. But we, we have community-based vaccinators and we, we have people who get the word out, like this woman, uh, who, who, you know, we really depend on people in the community to convince people that the vaccines are important and they need to get done. In fact, Rotary this year, between with the monies that we spend, the committee that I chair on behalf of Rotarians, we're allocating $150 million this year to help eradicate polio. And about 20% of it is simply for efforts like this woman, billboards, social media, getting the word out on uh, the, the need to, to, to get the true drops in the mouths and again, it's crucially important to have the, the political support. The uh, Randy uh, Spurl mentioned, you know, some of these statistics, but uh, you know, it's I, I had a chance a few years ago. This was in Calcutta to meet this uh, uh, young child with the, with the white dress. Uh, she uh, was the last case in India uh, for polio. Her name is Rushdie. The you know, very very sweet child. Uh, she's doing fine now. She's doing well. Uh, but you, you look at India has more children than any other country because, you know, China has, you know, different policies that have discouraged children, uh, people having children. But, uh, you know, to, to think, you know, as Randy explained, you know, that there's a last child, you know, anywhere. And, you know, all of the, you know, the 650,000 kids a year, children who are not getting polio because a group that you're affiliated with, Rotary, decided this isn't right. We can do better, we must do better. And you know, you just think of the logistics since 1988, when we really started raising all that money, three billion children have received the oral polio vaccine. We're also doing the, what they call IPV, the injection into the arm of, uh, of uh, what would be the, it was close to the original SOC campaign, uh, SOC vaccine. The, the Sabin one essentially that we use now is an oral polio vaccine that uh, is, is drops. But you know, in 2019, last year, 430 million kids, 40 countries, over a billion doses. You remember, think about polio. Think about polio. We're only immunizing kids under five. With COVID, 
it's the whole population around the world. And you just think of the logistics of that. You think of what's involved. You think of how long it might take. You think of polio. It's taken 65 years since the vaccine. And we're still in two countries. We're still not quite done. We still have 135 cases of the wild polio virus so far this year. And that's with a lot of money, a lot of attention, a lot of action. It's it's not easy. But fortunately, we, we have this uh, this uh, organization. You know, we're doing it with partners. You can't do anything alone. You need to do it with partners. Uh, you need to involve, involve other expertise. That's what Rotary did. It's what we continue to do. You know, earlier today, I was on a meeting with the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, UNICEF, with the uh, something called Gavi, which is a vaccine alliance, and with folks from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's all that working together that that gets it done. And you know, we're, we're making progress. We're we're definitely getting it done. And you know, when you look at this map and you look at all of these areas in red uh, on the left, that is, you know, that's the whole world had polio. You know, the from Indonesia to Russia to to Mexico. And you look now, it's just Afghanistan and Pakistan. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, and this shows the different regions. The, you know, where we, we, we had a lot of cases from 1980 to 2000 uh, and, and a few thereafter was India. That's the uh, Southeast Asia region. And today it's only in something we call the Eastern Mediterranean region. But, you know, you can see it could be done. And, you know, it'd be only nicer if, if we didn't have to extend so far to the right and that we've gotten this done in 2000, 2005. But, you know, sometimes the last little scribbles are, are difficult to do. So, you know, we, we, we are going to eradicate polio. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, you know, Rotary is, is funding, as I mentioned, $150 million a year. That's to get the drops in the mouths. It's funding hundreds of, I think it's about a million workers we give small stipends to a year. And a lot of what we need to do is surveillance. You know, a kid comes down with some sort of paralysis. They need to, to go uh, to a local health center. We're, help, we're helping to fund those. Uh, they, they take stool samples, uh, which then go to a laboratory. We're funding that. We're funding the transportation. It all adds together. You know, it's uh, if you ever have an opportunity to participate in something like polio eradication or even with COVID, you know, do it. Uh, you know, li life is short. Uh, it, uh, you know, it, 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 as awful as this is, and you, know, you look at the news this week, it's never been worse in terms of the number of cases, the number of issues. You know, coming out of this is, is truly creating history. And, you know, these pictures, the one on the far left was in the Philippines last November. Uh, we, we had a, a vaccine derived outbreak. The, the, the one in the, the top is uh, Pakistan, and the one in the bottom is Nigeria. And those were all visits in the last two or three years. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, doing volunteer work, you never regret. Uh, you, you, it's, uh, you know, something that's going to impact you the, the, the rest of your life. And, you know, so, you know, I really encourage you all, uh, you know, in, in Lodi and the other communities that you're from in that region, you know, there are going to be opportunities to directly participate in, in, in the COVID response. I'm sure you've already done things, but particularly in helping to give those that immunization. I know a lot of it's gonna be done in the hospital, but, but uh, in uh, medical areas and other things, but there are always opportunities to get involved. And I can remember you know, going to uh, a building here in the city, in the, nearby in the city of Portland, Maine, when they gave me the sugar cube for polio. And you know, my parents said we had to go back for a second dose. And I, I, I went back and they ended up putting a, some shots in my arm and I, I, was, I was very unhappy. I thought I was going to get another tasty sugar cube, uh, but instead uh, I got the shot in the arm. But you know, it, it it didn't persuade me not to do it. So you know, some you know, it's it, these are tough times. I, I get it. You know, make make the make the most of it. You know, uh, you know. Hopefully, they're not going to put up signs in your community saying you can't go to the next community. But you know, I I realize in the short term we're we're almost living in a situation like that. So, uh, you know, we we'll. we'll We'll bear our way through this. We'll we'll wear our mask. We'll do all these things, and we're going to come out just fine on the other end. And and uh, you know and you know seize the moment, all of you. Uh, do do whatever you can to help out uh, help out others. You'll never regret it. So I uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity, and I'm looking forward to the questions. I you know I, 
I sadly don't get a, a, too many opportunities to speak to interact uh, groups. So I'm particularly pleased that uh, Carol invited me and uh, happy to answer any questions and uh, I'll leave it at that for now. So thank you. So, someone gonna moderate the questions, I think. Yes. Thank you um, so much, Mr. Mike McGovern, um, for taking your time and sharing with us your great experiences. Um, so now is the time that if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat. I'm gonna start off by asking Mr. McGovern and Mr. Sprawl some questions of my own. Will you guys do that? So, um, <laughs> Mr. McGovern and Mr. Sprawl, my first question for you will be, what would you say was your best accomplishment accomplishment towards Polio Plus? Uh, you know, it's, to me, that this isn't personal. It's, you know, there's a million Rotarians, over a million around the world. And, you know, I, I think the best thing, my biggest accomplishment was just joining Rotary. Uh, joining an organization where people are committed to something, they have the passion, the persistence, the patience. Uh, you know, I, I, I could point out a lot of things, you know, uh, you know, I do a lot of committee work, a lot of trying to fundraise, uh, meeting with, you know, world leaders. It, it's, it's, it's really, you know, it, it's been an amazing experience, but uh, what uh, carries me forward every day is looking at all, in all the other Rotarians who have the passion as well to, uh, to contribute. Mr. Spell, what, what was your biggest accomplishment with Polio Plus? I, I, my biggest accomplishment has been that I've had the opportunity as the District 6250 Polio Chair, I've had the opportunity to visit every one of the clubs in our district and tell the story of Rotary's efforts to eradicate polio. And we've been able, by simply telling the story of Rotary, we've been able to raise an awful lot of money in our district. And that's been very rewarding because I know that with every 50 cents that we raise, that means there's one less child that will have to go through what my dad went through. So that, that's been really, really rewarding for me. Thank you so much for that. That is very important for us all to know. And also I see some more questions popping up in the chat right now. Um, there's one for Mr. McGovern. Um, it is, how did your professional and rotary backgrounds lead you to your current role? Yeah, I served as a town manager here in the community of Cape Elizabeth where I live. That's why I happened to get up in the tower. We actually, the town owned the lighthouse. And I did that for 31 years. And, and you know, I worked for a, a seven member town council. I, I was the town manager for 31 years, as they said. And you know they were very supportive and very helpful. Uh, in fact, when, when I retired, in in lieu of a gift, uh, they 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 you know then these people never got paid anything. They were unpaid elected officials. Uh, they they ended up in lieu of a gift. They they asked different people if they'd give money to, to uh, the polio campaign, and they collected over four thousand uh, dollars. And you know that just shows that you know. They, they were committed, but, but the work as a, as, a, as a town manager, you know, a lot of it is working with volunteers, uh, working with, you know, people with different interests, hearing different viewpoints, and uh, a lot of committee work. And I found it was very helpful uh, with polio. And within Rotary, uh, you know, I served as a club president and something called a district governor, and then ended up on the Rotary International Board after a while. Uh, and, uh, on the, the foundation, Rotary Foundation Board, and they asked me to chair the polio thing. And I think a lot of it is the reason they did is uh, because, uh, you know, I listen to a lot of viewpoints and uh, respect everyone's viewpoints and I'm willing to, you know, immerse myself in other cultures and experiences uh, that I might otherwise not be familiar with. And, you know, I, I look at it, you know, Ro Rotary has allowed me to do so many things that initially would make me feel uncomfortable. You, you know, I'm not going to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I'm not going to that that uh, uh, camp for 60,000 people who escaped Boko Haram. But you know what? You do it. Uh, yeah, they may have some guns, you know, protecting you. But, uh, you know, they're just yeah. wonderful experiences. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I think the more experiences you have, the more you become comfortable 
doing things that are sort of outside of your skin. And, uh, you know, I really encourage, uh, you know, do things that you don't feel comfortable doing. I see another question for Mr. McGovern that actually kind of goes off of this, but um, can you speak about how um, and if Rotary can negotiate with the Taliban in order to try to get to places government agencies cannot? Yeah, it, it, that's a great question. You know, we don't, it, it, I always worry with all of these phone conversations I have about the Taliban that I'm, I'm thinking the CIA must be following me all the time. Uh, but, but anyway, you know, we don't negotiate directly with the Taliban. Uh, we do uh, through, particularly through UNICEF and through intermediary, intermediary parties uh, talk to the Taliban. The Taliban has banned house to house vaccinations in Afghanistan currently. And sadly for the last year and a half, it's, it's why this year we actually have a growth in cases in Afghanistan while we don't in, in Pakistan. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, they, they care for their children. They love their children. Uh, they, they just, you know, after the, all of the drones and after there was a doctor who went to Osama bin Laden's house uh, with, uh, you know, to ask questions about vaccinations. It wasn't a polio one, but regardless, it was just an awful lot of mistrust. Uh, you know, there have been negotiations uh, that the U.S. government has had uh, with the Taliban over the last year. And, you know, fortunately, three times in the last year, I was invited to meetings in Washington where I, I got to meet with the people who were sitting directly with the Taliban from the U.S. government uh, to talk about all the different issues uh, in Afghanistan, but particularly, uh, you know, one of the issues that we've talked about, and, you know, and this is what in, in a group setting as well as one-on-one, -on -one, been talk to them about, you know, health issues and interventions in, in, in health. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a difficult challenge. And just, you know, today I read in the time new york times or somewhere that there's concern that you know over the next two months uh during the transition period uh that uh there, there was this there was something that we don't even want to bother to talk to the taliban and you know that concerned me we you know for polio's sake we got to talk to the taliban uh because uh you know we're not going to get it done unless they get on board and uh they're helpful Thank you so much. That definitely summarizes that one. I actually have another question for you that I see that's more about more um, recent issues that might have come up that um, are affecting the ability to immunize children. So um, what are some of the challenges that you see with trying to immunize children from polio during the COVID-19 pandemic? You know, I, I think we've overcome most of them. Uh, you know, when things really began to to be obvious as to how serious an issue this was uh, in early March, we suspended all of our activities that related to going house to house. Uh, we continued training, we, con we continued uh, testing, we continued contact tracing, even for COVID as well as for, for uh, polio. But, you know, but during the, the few months after that, you know, we, we invested heavily in the personal protective equipment, the mask, uh, the sanit the uh, hand sanitizer. Uh, we did training on hand washing, and we we basically uh, trained all of our volunteers to uh, to to be able to deal in a, in a COVID world. Uh, we've resumed house to house vaccinations in quite a few countries, not all of them, but most of them, and if things have gone well. The refusals uh, have have been low, and and, all, and also uh, we're also using some funds. We're buying soap and hand sanitizer and we're giving that to people in the households as well so they're not only getting the polio drops they're also getting something else of use to them uh so you know we, we're confident going forward you know we just you know it, i look at it as our priorities for the year and right at the very top is we need to keep our our polio uh, workers safe and we need to make sure we do absolutely nothing to to endanger uh those that we're trying to serve uh when we're, when we're giving the polio drops. Thank you so much for sharing that knowledge with us. Um, now I have a question for Mr. Sprawl. Um, what do you suggest for younger people like us to do in order to help eradicate polio?
Mr. Sproul, are you still here? You need to unmute Randy. Okay, yeah, I, I cut out there for a second. So I think I, can you hear me now? Yeah, um, our question was, what do you suggest for younger people um, like us to help with eradicating polio? You know, I think one of the most important things is, is spread the word about polio. Fortunately, you know, the, 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 the fact that polio has been eradicated from the United States since 1977 is kind of a two-edged sword. It means that anybody who was born after 1977 knows nothing about polio. That's a good thing. On the other hand, most people don't realize that polio still continued to exist uh, throughout the rest of the world and still does exist in two countries. So I think just tell the story of Rotary and, and uh, polio and what Rotary has done uh, in the fight to eradicate polio. And, and one thing I'd like to suggest to everyone, the next time you get a chance to talk to your grandparents, ask them about their experiences with polo, polio. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they will all tell you about friends of theirs, neighbors of theirs who contracted polio. And I'm sure they will have, uh, you know, some very interesting stories to tell you. And they'll tell you about uh, the anxiety we went through as we are going through the COVID epidemic. But uh, as Mike said, we made it through polio. We're going to get through COVID. Okay. And then thank you so much. I have another question for either of you. And this one is... Um, can either of you tell us if the U.S. government or other countries have reached out to Rotary to assist with COVID-19 vaccinations? Uh, you know, the U.S. government has not, but other countries have. Uh, they're very interested in, in using our polio network to uh, assist, particularly with the logistics. Uh, you know, we, we've, asked, we've actually spent on COVID uh, of the what we call the Global Polio Eradication Initiative about $70 million this year directly uh, on COVID using, using our, our, our workforce and uh, some of our other resources. Uh, but you know, the, the US government has, a, you know, there's been discussions, the chairman of the Rotary Foundation, he's from Sri Lanka. And I've had three or four discussions with him, including this week. Uh, you know, and he is very interested in Rotarians helping to deliver the vaccines, helping with the social mobilization. But I, I think it's actually gonna vary by country. My understanding in the US is a lot of the logistics are going to be handled by the military, and then they're going to be using the, uh, you know, the existing medical system, the, you know, all the all of our doctors' offices and CVS and Walgreens and Rite Aid if it's still around, and you know, all of those places to deliver the vaccines. So, you now I think you do what's right based on which the resources are available at any given time, and you know, fortunately here in our country, you know, we 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 do have these big drug stores. We have you know places like you know, Target and Walmart and, you know, Sam's. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's going to take a total national effort. And, uh, you know, I think with, you know, the leadership of, uh, you know, the, the, the United States government, uh, you know, whoever's in charge, although it's pretty clear who's going to be in charge. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be, I, I think we'll be just fine. And, and I'm not being political. I think, you know, you know, I think President Trump, uh, you know, while, you know, obviously there's been some challenges and issues with the pandemic, you know, I think his whole sense of, you know, a, a whole of government, a whole of industry approach, uh, you know, he was right on that, uh, that, uh, you know, we do need to fully involve the private sector in uh, helping to get this done. Thank you so much. I think that closes up for what we have for questions. Now I'm going to pass this on to back to Seema and Stella. If you would like to, Rachel, before sending it back, were you able to, um, I saw a lot of the Interact Clubs announce where they were from. That would be fun for everybody to know um, in general. Yes, I saw that we have people from Interact Clubs such as Lodi, Onalaska, La Crosse, Fort Atkinson, and um, Mount Horeb. So thank you all for attending. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Rachel, for fielding the questions. Now, this is gonna bring us to the conclusion um, of our webinar. Oh, and we also have Baraboo as well joined us, thank you. All right, 
So in the midst of this global pandemic, we have hoped we've informed you on more on the pandemic of polio and how you can use your personal experiences um, from Randy Sproul and Mr. Mike McGovern to make a difference with their Polio Plus. They've shown us just so many um, different examples. I think today with our webinar, it, like Mr. Randy said, that we got people together to spread more awareness to more generations and connect Rotary and Interact Clubs more and help each other to grow on this and to get those last two countries out and do our part and learn our part. And I think awareness is more, more valuable than anything. And I think it was really great. And it was such an honor to have our speakers today. So much value to this webinar, Mr. Mike McGovern and Mr. Randy Sproul. Thank you so much for coming and contributing and joining us today to help us be more informed and about your experiences and everything. Thank you so much. If everyone could give a little silent round of applause for our both, uh, both of our special guest speakers. Thank you. <laughs> All right, and then lastly, I'd like to thank everyone else for their time and helping broaden polio awareness throughout our webinar. Um, I think it's just so incredible how you can take the time to come and learn about um, polio, as in many kids, like in my generation personally, they don't know about these um, past um, viruses that have affected our world as uh, coronavirus has today. And I think it's just really important to just be aware because awareness just brings so much um, change and notice uh, through uh, rotary groups, through politics, and it's something you should have in your everyday life. Um, now, I think we've officially concluded our webinar. Um, I will mention that we do have a donation link that is directly to Polio Plus that's connected with Mr. Mike McGovern and Mr. Randy Sproul. So if you could go to the chat and if you feel like you want to donate, that'd be fantastic. It goes directly to Polio Funds. Um, and I'll just have you look at that, um, the link. And I'd once again want to thank everyone for coming. Um, this is the Lodi Interact Club and we wish you a good rest of your day. Thank you everyone, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you.